4.5 is databases and distributed systems. So our first bunch of objectives are really talking about the ideas of data consistency, redundancy, and then talking about normalization. Now this process is reasonably straightforward, but it's easy to forget. First of all, data consistency is making sure the data in your database is consistent through constantly applying validation, indexing, and all that sort of good stuff. It's also the idea that when we do a multi-table query, in other words, we're accessing more than one table, we stack all those changes so that they all execute or none of them do. Data redundancy then is unnecessarily duplicating data and this wastes storage space processing time and can lead to inaccuracies because whenever you need to update one, you have to update many. Data independence is separating the data from its storage scheme and programs that access it, allowing us to change the database that are breaking the links to the programs. And what this does is it means the data can be manipulated and edited in its schema without affecting the programs that talk to it. Now, we've all seen a flat file database before. This is a database for a school and it's stored in a single table, as if it was an Excel spreadsheet. You notice there's data redundancy there. I'm putting the same data in multiple times. A lot of information in there is a bit ridiculous, so we're gonna start normalizing this. The process to get to first normal form is to make sure that each field must only contain one item of data, so we break anything up that's got multiple bits of data in it. And we must make sure that all the attributes must be dependent on the primary key. Now what that means in plain English is that what we're gonna do is split the tables up so that they all contain only information relevant to a certain entity. So looking at this table, we seem to have three things on it. We've got information about the subject, we've got information about the teacher, and we've got information about the student. So let's separate those. Let's put those as their own tables. You'll notice straight away, we've reduced the overall amount of data that we need to store. I've also added a key field to each table. That's the first field in the list that gives a unique value for each item in there. Second normal form then has to be in first normal form already and should have no partial dependencies. So partial dependencies in this case is the students link we've got over there because we are repeating our class numbers and our class IDs, which we shouldn't be. So what that really means is this probably needs to be a separate table to connect students to the classes uh, that they're in. I've called this the enrollment table and got an, an enrolled ID there. And all that does is it links the class to a student. So now that's in second norm normal form because there are no partial dependencies at all. Third normal form is taking second normal form and removing transitive dependencies. Now transitive dependencies are where we're storing information that could duplicate. So for instance, in this class table here, the subject, that should really be a separate thing because there could be multiple computer science lessons in year 11. There could be multiple business lessons in year 11. We don't see any repetition there because they just aren't in this data set at the moment, but they could be. So that's a transitive dependency. We need to take that out and we need to create that as its own table. And notice I've linked it with an ID. There's also another transitive dependency on here. If you look at the room, the room will probably be repeated in terms of the class. So let's take those out and let's put the room somewhere separate. So now that class table, which tells us uh, which classes we've got, have a specific room, a specific subject, and a specific teacher, and they're all linked. They only have to be typed in once. And there's your third normal form database. Now, that means we have the least amount of data to store, and the computer does a lot of processing to connect everything up, but there should be no redundancy at all at this point. Entity relationships then are how we talk about the relationships between these tables. We've got some options, we've got one-to-one. -one. You will really, if ever, use this uh, because one record has to have a, a matched unique record in a different table and this is only really done if part of that record needs to be secured in a different way. You wouldn't really do this with just general data. Uh, the most common one is a one-to-many relationship and one record has many linked records in a different table and that's the easiest one to computerize. Many-to-many -many is where many records have many links, but it cannot be computerized easily. So we tend to convert a many-to-many -to, -many to a one-to-many relationship by using a linking table. Here's those same tables again, defined in entity diagrams. You'll see it's just the name of the table at the top and the list of fields underneath. An entity diagram explains how they all relate to each other. So let's move these around a little bit so that makes a bit more sense. And you'll see the first thing that we need to say is that one student can appear in the enrollments table multiple times. That makes sense there. I like to picture this as where's the drop-down menu going to go, and the drop-down menu goes on the many side. We're also going to say that one class can be enrolled many times, 
Uh, and therefore then the classes links, one subject can be in the classes list many times, one teacher can be in the classes list many times, and one room can be in the classes list many times. That's how all the tables relate to each other, and that's probably far more complicated than you'll ever really need to do in an exam situation. The next objective is data validation and verification. We did this at AS, so I'll just refresh a big list. You've got your presence check to make sure something's there, your length check to see how many characters you've got, your range check to see if uh, a, a numerical value exists between other values, a lookup check to see if something's part of a list, a format check to see if it looks a certain way, are letters in certain positions, are symbols in certain positions, a type check to see if it's an integer or float or a boolean, and then you've got your verification. Now the difference is validation checks it looks okay, verification checks that it is correct. And there are far fewer methods of verification. There's dual entry where you type something in twice, like the password field when you sign up for a new account, and then there's proofreading where you just read it to check it's okay. SQL, commonly called SQL, is structured query language, and this is a method of searching and creating databases in a programmatical way. We need to know a decent bit about it. Here's our first example, this creates a table. It creates a table called teacher with the primary key called teacher ID, which is an integer. Then we've got a first name, which is a set of characters or letters with a potential maximum of 128. Then we've got salary, which is an, a numeric data type. And the way that works is the first number tells us how many digits we can have, so seven. And the second number tells us how many decimals we can have, so two. Uh, so this gives us a maximum salary of £9,999,999.99. Date of birth is a date, a date time data type. Email then uh, is a, a letters again, a maximum of 256, but it can't be empty. That's what not null means. And then the last line is where we tell it what the primary key is, and that's going to be teacher ID. How do we find something in a database like that then? Well, we use a select query. This says select asterisk or select everything from the teacher table where the salary is greater than £50,000 and the first name's Peter. We're going to get those results back and we're going to see all the fields. Now, slightly changing that, here in this select query, I've said which fields I want to see. So I only want to see the email and the first name from the teacher table uh, where their salary is greater than 50000 or it's less than 30000 and I want them in the order of the salary from smallest to biggest. Here's how we add data into a table. We use the insert command. We say insert into the teacher's table, and then the values. Then in brackets are the values in the order that the fields exist. I've got my key field, I've got my name, I've got my salary, I've got my date of birth, and I've got my email address. All those things need to be in the correct order in this method for it to be inserted into the database. Here's how we change data that's already there. We use the update tool. We update the teacher's table. Uh, we set the date of birth to that value where the teacher ID is 55. So it finds teacher 55 and changes their date of birth. There are three other bits we need to know about as well. In can be part of the where. So we can say select star from table where something in something. And that get, allows us to give a list of options or a subquery. So we could say where the user ID is in and then a list of them, or we could say where a user ID is in and then we could do a subquery, we could do another select query to get a list of user IDs. Group by groups the records by a specified field and that's really useful if you've got lots of repeated data and you just want to have sort of one of each and, and add up the total or something. And then we've got all the inequality symbols that you normally use in an if statement, greater than and equal to, less than or equal to, not equal to, all that sort of stuff you can use in the query. Database management systems then, I like to imagine the database management system as if it was the interface between the actual data and all the processes that need to access it. And it's the bit that enforces the access rights. It's the bit that says, your name's not down, sunshine, you're not coming in. It's the bit that allows you to have different users and different levels of access to different parts of the data. And it's a really crucial part of the system. It also manages the queries and things like that. Data dictionary is then how we explain how the data tables look in real life. This was part of your unit two exam last year, the practical part where you would have to write data dictionaries again and again and again. The headings are what you need and you just need to fill that in for your table. Big data then, big data is a really exciting thing. It's where data becomes so large and complex that it's difficult to process it using standard techniques. This could be, for instance, all the information about every click you've ever made on Amazon. That's big data, that's 
gigabytes of data about each and every person and there are millions and millions of people that use that so that data is so huge that it can't be stored or manipulated in the normal way but if we could do that we could find out some interesting things a data warehouse is a storage technology that allows us to store big data sets usually using multiple servers and data arrays data mining is the process where we analyze large amounts of data so it's getting that big data and doing something to it and predictive analysis is where we use that data and we model or machine learn from that big data. Now, machine learning is very in vogue at the moment, and you can't really do machine learning without big data. Finally, distributed systems, then there are two different parts. Distributed data, where the data is stored across multiple computers, systems, or servers, and distributed processing, where we split the processing up across multiple computers. Now, this is different from parallel processing because parallel normally involves all the computer systems all the parallelization being on the same computer system. This would actually split the job up and send it to different physical devices to complete, pulling them all back together and working out the result. Now the positives of distribution are that they're more resilient because there are more nodes. If part of them are broken or part of them don't work, there's still a lot to work. It's better for security because we can send secure data to places that are more secure and data that's not necessarily needing that much security to places that are least secure. And we can increase the security on those high security parts. And finally, scaling. If I need to increase the processing power or the amount of data I need to store, it's very easy for me to add more nodes in this model, which it would be difficult to do in a standalone computer system.